They are the world's preeminent experts, pioneers, and advocates in today's regenerative agriculture movement. Through years of practical experience on their own farms and ranches, and by learning from other experts and researchers across the globe, they've learned how to successfully farm and ranch in nature's image. To grow healthier soil, food, farms, and profits. And they've dedicated their lives to teach others how to do the same. But not everyone can attend their in-person training. So these soil whisperers have created Region Ag 101, a virtual soil health academy school that farmers, educators, gardeners, and other friends of the earth can access 24-7 from virtually anywhere. Now, regeneration is just one click away for everyone. Hello everyone. On behalf of Understanding Ag and Soil Health Academy, we want to welcome you to today's webinar. Today's webinar is Insects, a little known force of nature shaping your farmland with Dr. Mike Bredesen. I want to welcome everyone here. First thing is please make sure that you are on mute. Uh, we don't want any interruptions, if at all possible. Also, uh, we will be taking questions and answers at the end of this webinar. So please type your questions into the question box on the bottom of the page. Back in 2011, I had the good fortune of meeting Dr. Jonathan Lundgren at a No-Till on the Plains conference in Kansas. And it really opened my eyes as to how important insects are to a farm and ranch. It was shortly thereafter when Dr. Lundgren brought a team of, at that time, grad students up to my ranch near Bismarck. One of those grad students was Mike Bredesen and I gravitated to him immediately because of his passion and enthusiasm for insects and most importantly, how those insects could benefit me as a rancher. So uh, we've developed a friendship over the years and it truly is a pleasure tonight for me to introduce you to Dr. Mike Bredesen. Mike, take it away. Awesome, Gabe, can you hear me? Sure can. All right, Coolio, sounds good. Thanks for that introduction. And I do remember that first time coming up to your ranch just like it was yesterday. Um, looking at some of the amazing things that you've got going on up there and peeling back some of those layers of detritus that I remember out on some of your fields and seeing the insects just scurry like I'd never seen them before. So the relationship is built and I'm glad that I've had the opportunity since then to go out on a heck of a lot more farms and seeing uh, other farmers start to do some of the same types of stuff. So it's really exciting. Thanks so much for the invite. So Let's get started here tonight. Um, first of all, I want, I'm gonna keep the talk a little bit light, kind of informative. Um, and, you know, I'm just glad that we're all able to warm up tonight with the webinar, because, you know, normally I would say up here in the Midwest, we're kind of chilly, there's nothing else to do. But from the sounds of things on the news, it doesn't seem like there's a place in the whole country that's not frozen right now. So, you know, cold is cold is crummy, but I think everything's a little bit relative, right? Sometimes we might forget that uh, if it was summertime, we'd have to be dealing with other things, right? The swarms of mosquitoes. So all things being relative, maybe it's not so bad. But really as a bug person, I kind of miss the mosquitoes and all the bugs, right? So that's, that's what I do, that's what I love. I, I get so excited about talking about them. So that's, I, I'm excited today that I get to share that, that passion with all of you, especially in the context of what insect life and insect ecology means on the farm, okay? And I'm gonna start things out by talking about one of 
the special critters that I think most people, I could speak for most people, that they would consider probably their favorite animal in the world, and that is the mosquito, right? I think that's pretty undeniable. Uh, everyone has a pretty strong affection for this little creature. And I, it's easy to see why, right? I mean, look at this image that I've got up here. I took this underneath the microscope. You can see I'm sitting right here by my, uh, by my microscope tonight. So this is where I do, this is where the magic happens. All right, this beautiful creature, iridescent wings, gold-like threads all over its body. And these eyes, I mean, look at those crazy compound eyes. Its whole head is taken up by eyeballs. It's beautiful, right? And, and this creature is, is really interesting too, right? Everyone, uh, everyone loves this creature so much and, and it's time we learn a little bit more about it, right? So first things first is that female mosquitoes are the only ones that actually bite you, okay? And when we look at the female versus the male mosquito, there's some things that stand out right away. Okay, the female over here, she's got these long slender antennae. And then when we look over at the male mosquito, we actually don't encounter them all that often. And you may be surprised to see what that critter actually looks like. Look at these antennae, right? We call these in the entomological world, right? the bug world, we call them plumos antennae. And you can see why, right? Because they look like the plumage of a bird. Okay, and the reason why we encounter females more often is because they're searching out a blood meal, okay, and they need to suck some blood in order for their eggs to develop. That's the only time that they actually go and, uh, and, and suck blood is it's because they're looking to nurture their eggs and, and have their eggs be viable. So next time you swat a, mos swat at a mosquito, you maybe have a little bit of mercy on them, right, because it's just a, just a female trying to uh, nurture those eggs into adulthood. Okay, so why, why, you know, mosquitoes are so cool. Why else are they so cool? All right, well, mosquitoes also, uh, this is kind of an interesting little historical factoid. If there weren't mosquitoes, I'd most likely be speaking to all of you in the French language. How on earth could that be? Well, way, way back, Napoleon Bonaparte, when he was on his bid to conquer the whole world was stopped in his tracks as he tried to enter the Western Hemisphere, right? And the Americas through Haiti. And his armies encountered something that he couldn't plan for. And, and it was such an immense force that he could not overtake it. And that immense force, that army that he couldn't overcome, there were mosquitoes. And these mosquitoes were spreading the deadly disease of yellow fever. So mosquitoes, wow, they're, they're, shaping, they're shaping our human history. Okay, that's pretty incredible. All right, well, what about this one? How, how, on this could, how on earth could this be? Mosquitoes, without mosquitoes, we would have probably deforested some of the earth's greatest forests long ago. How could that be? I was in a talk one time uh, and a very smart entomolog uh, entom uh, entomologist came up and he said that, and I just couldn't hardly believe it. I needed to explain a little bit better, and, and he did. He explained it to me. And he said, mosquitoes have prevented humans from exploring and exploiting some of the most wild interiors on the face of the earth. Okay, I'm gonna stop my share for one second and see if I can, oopsie, sorry. All right. And get to oopsie daisies, you guys. I'm sorry, I'm messing this up. I'm gonna get to our different screen if I can figure that out. Sorry, guys. Share my screen. Here we go. I'm finding it. Okay, if you've never discovered this tool before, this is called Google Earth Engine. And what you, you guys, it's, it's an incredible tool and it shows through history as, long, as far back as we have satellite imagery data, it shows an, air, an area throughout time. Okay, and this particular area on my screen, this is in Southern Brazil. Okay, so this is 
the Amazon rainforest back in 1984. And I'm gonna click the play button here, see what happens to this area in just a few short years, right? Since the mid eighties. So look at that area that we're, that, that is being, something is happening, right? What is going on there? It's actually land conversion. And what is so impressive is to think that up until recent days, when we have the technological wonder, wonders of, of insect repellents, of enclosed cabs on, on logging equipment, this wasn't even possible because of the crazy force that is the mosquito and, and insects in general. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing there. Okay, so why why all this talk about mosquitoes? Okay, I feel like I'm I'm beating a dead horse here. Are we really here to talk about mosquitoes all night? Well, no, I don't I don't think so. But what I'm trying to highlight, you guys, is that mosquitoes are just one one species of insect out of nearly seven million species of land living invertebrates. Okay, invertebrates are insects and spiders and mites and columbula. Basically, they're all the little creepy crawly things that most of them live beneath the soil surface. And we can't, we don't regularly see them uh, with our own eyes. It's easy to forget something like that, that we don't see all that often. But think about that for a second. The immense diversity of the insect world, right? For comparison, there's only about 6,500 uh, species of mammals on the entire planet. Okay, so think about that immense diversity of this group, seven million species of land, uh, land living invertebrates. And they're not just a diverse group, their abundance, right? Their numbers are also absolutely mind boggling. So if you had a scale, if we take a scale, one of those old fashioned scales where you can weigh something against something, right? And you put all of the animals on the entire earth, except for insects on one side. And then you took all of the insects on the entire earth and put it on the other side. The insects would actually weigh more than the rest of the entire animal kingdom. You guys, I don't know how I can, under, how I can understate this because the earth is literally crawling with insects. And that is so fascinating to think about because insects are this huge force of nature that are gobbling up, they're pooping, they're flying, they're pollinating, they're doing all these insane things. And guess what? They never sleep, right? As long as they're alive, they're doing them and they are shaping the world that we live in every second of every day. Okay, so insects are this great force of nature. And the second thing, what's the point? What am, I, what am I trying to get at here? It would be insane of us to try and not, to not try and use this crazy immense force of nature to help us transform the ecosystems that we, that we manage, right? And we manage farmland, right? We get this incredible opportunity as producers, as farmers, to dictate what happens on a piece of land. And the choices that we make really has profound consequences for how well that land is going to uh, support this force of nature that I keep talking about, okay? Really, invertebrates are free on-farm laborers. That's how I like to, excuse me, how I like to think about them. And, you know, when you have on-farm labor, you wanna be doing everything in your power to make sure that that labor, that you get all the work that can possibly be gotten from that labor, right? Especially when that labor is free, right? It is wonderful. Harness that labor all you can. So what are, what are these laborers doing, these free workers on your farm? Well, they're, they're doing all sorts of stuff, right? Pollinators, predators, we've got herbivores, we've got things that eat seeds, right? Those are called granivores. And we've got this incredibly enormous group, probably the biggest group of them all, which are decomposers. 
And what are they eating, right? They're crawling through turds for a living. They're crawling through the soil, trying to break down detritus and dead plant matter. And they're hunting for microbes, trying to cycle those, the, the nutrients that are in those microbes back into the soil. So if we've got this group of laborers free and willing to help on our farms, why not? You know, it'd be nuts for us to not try and take advantage of that. So let's learn, let's try and learn tonight, tonight a little bit on how exactly we can harness this incredible group of critters and make them an asset on our, on our farms. Okay, so here is one such critter that I guarantee all of you are familiar with. This is the honeybee. And this is one of the critters that is an incredible asset to a farm, a garden, an agricultural industry. And this is a, this is a beehive that I've got out back of my place. It's got a big B for Bredesen written on the side of that hive there. That's so I know that when I've got my hive set out in the field, those belong to me. And I think it's great to just be able to see up close some of these critters working, right? It's an absolute frenzy what they are doing. Right? It's, it's actually, it, I, I love it. I could sit next to my beehive and watch them all day long. Okay, now <clears throat> on the same theme of bees, okay, we're still thinking bees right now, and we're still thinking these types of critters that are so beneficial potentially to our farming operations, right? We're sticking on this theme of insects are this incredible force of nature that we need to be promoting, right? So the number I've got up here, 70 million, 312,500. That's a pretty big number. I'm gonna stop sharing for just one second so you can see my screen. I hope that you can all see this. Okay, what do I have here? This is a jar of seeds. Okay, it's sunflower seeds. I'm not sure if you can see that very well or not, but they're blue. They don't look like your typical sunflower seeds, right? Maybe I'll shine my light on them right here real quick. <clears throat> they're blue. So what on earth could that mean? Are they the new, you know, blueberry flavored sunflower seed from Dakota seeds or spits or whatever? No, not exactly. These are actually treated seeds. They've been coated with a, a neonicotinoid insecticide. And I did the math. Okay, so on the inside of this jar, it's not that big of a jar, right? It's not a full mason jar. But there's enough active ingredient within this jar right now of insecticide to kill 70,312,500 honeybees. Okay, I, I don't know if, I don't know how, how one couldn't sort of have their mind boggled by that, right? It's just such a small amount here. And I do think that sometimes as, as farmers, as, as humans, we, we often revert to chemistry to solve a lot of our problems. And it can be kind of beautiful, right? Chemistry can be beautiful, can be charismatic. But when we stop and we think about the immense magnitude of some of the actions that we take as farmers, it, it's, it's, pretty, it's really quite amazing to consider. Okay, I hope you guys are all seeing this. So now this map right here is a map of the type of insecticide use that's in this jar right here, okay? And as you can see, it is, I would consider pretty widespread. The entire Midwest is, is blanketed in this type of pesticide every spring. Okay, to the tune of over, over a pound of the active ingredient per acre. And in the United States, about every spring, we apply about, about almost 8 million pounds of this insecticide every year. I'm just going to remind you one more time of that number, right? Just within this jar, this tiny little jar, these blue seeds, enough to kill 70 million 
312,500 honeybees. <clears throat> okay, so today is all about changing paradigms, right? The reason why we're all logged on to an understanding ag webinar is because we're all ready for a change in the paradigm. So what if we, instead of trying to figure out how to swim upstream, right, swim up current, and fight this immense force that is insects, what, what, is the, what is the possibility? What are the possibilities, right? If we try and encourage them rather than trying to suppress them, what might be the result? So if we're going to start talking about how to promote some of these laborers, some of these farmers, or some, sorry, some of these helpers on our farms, we better meet them, right? You'd never hire a farmhand without giving them an interview. So let's go, let's do it. All right, so how do invertebrates, these invertebrates are free laborers, how do they work? So I've got a couple guys up here right now. These free laborers are, are gonna be our tunnelers. They're gonna be the guys that are, uh, they're bioturbating the soil, right? They are built like actual little bulldozers. Okay, and you can see that. It's like they're, it's like they've got a steel shell on the outside of their body. And that's, that design is really helpful as they're scratching through the soil. They need that super hard exoskeleton so they don't get shredded up in the soil. Okay, and they're diggers, right? They're digging tunnels through the soil and they're adapted perfectly to do that. You can see this critter on the left side here. It's actually got scoop shovels for hands, right? It's got little rakes and little scoop shovels for hands. And one of the first days in an entomology class, they tell you what kind of uh, legs different insects have, okay? And these legs are called fossorial legs. And, you know, you dig for fossils, right? So it's a really easy one to remember. These kind of legs are used for digging. And these critters don't stop there, right? They don't stop with this wonderful design of their legs. They also have this crazy spade looking head on them. Right? And that's to, as they're digging through soil or digging through a big turd, they can throw soil out of the way and dig themselves deep into the soil, right? Increasing water infiltration, burying organic matter deeper in the soil uh, um, and, and, and improving our, our water infiltration and our aeration of our soils. So these guys are, are, pretty, good, are pretty good workers on our farm, right? We're, we we want to keep those guys around. All right. So what else do insects do? All right, well, they poop too, right? Everybody poops, we can't get around it. And uh, if we're interviewing a, a worker on our farm uh, and they say that they poop is on, is on their resume, well, that's you know, usually maybe something you leave off a resume, but when it's, when it's all the insects on your farm, that's actually a really good thing to see, okay? So why, you know, why is it such a great thing that insects are pooping all over the place? Because every time an insect poops, and I really want people to, to understand this today because it is something that not many people know, but it is so important when it comes to having the ability as a farmer to literally increase the organic matter and stability of your soils, right? It all has to do with insect poop, and I'll explain here in just a second. First of all, I wanna talk about this critter here on the right side. I'm buzzing through things too quickly, but right here, this is actually one of the more common beetles that we find on farms across the Midwest. It's the smallest type of beetle in the world. It's called a Tiliad beetle, and I've got it super zoomed in right here. And, and you look at it under the scope, you're like, what on earth is happening here? Is this a bird? Now it's got these feathers, right? I'm supposed to see wings back here, but that's how small this critter is. Instead of having these long membranous wings, it actually uses feather-like wings to fly. It's incredible, you guys. It, everyone should buy a microscope, tease apart some soil and see what's happening down there because it's, a, it's like a different sci-fi movie every single day. All right, so insects poop. If we're gonna talk about insect poop, we talk, we gotta talk about insect digestion, all right? And this is a, this is a pretty fascinating little bit here. And, and I hope you guys all take something away with this. All right, so here we've got our, our model critter here, our model insect. 
And up here, we've got the, the pre-oral cavity. So this is essentially the mouth, all right? And as an insect swallows the food, all right, it comes gobbling down here. Okay, and then it comes down to the crop. So I've got chickens in my backyard. They've not been so happy in this cold snap because they've not been able to get out and about very often. But if, if, if everyone has chickens or butchered a chicken, they know chickens have this, this organ, right? They, they, they eat a bunch of food and then it gets stuck in their, in their crop, okay? And then it slowly gets fed into what? The gizzard, okay? And that gizzard grinds up all the food and makes it more digestible for the intestines. Insects are actually very, very similar to that chicken model, okay? So our food comes in the mouth, gobble, 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 stored in the crop, and then slowly it works through this organ right here called the proventriculus, right? And this is really cool. The proventriculus is the insect version of a gizzard. Right here, we've got a, a, a cartoon of it on the left side. And here we've got on the right side, an actual picture of it. I didn't take this picture. I wish I had, because it's really cool. But what this person has done is they've ripped out the guts of an insect, probably a cricket, and then they've flipped that proventriculus or that gizzard inside out. So we can actually see all these sclerotized, these hardened teeth that grind up and mash up all the bits that that insect is is trying to pass through itself, right? These are hard seed coats. These are, um, these are fungal spores, right? These are the exoskeletons of, of prey items. These are really hard things that, that get ground up by this, by this incredible organ. All right, so now after we've passed through the crop and the proventriculus and gotten all ground up, this is where the real magic happens. Uh, here is where we enter the midgut. So this is a really cool part of the insect where most of the nutrient uh, absorption happens. But you see this little dotted line right here? Hopefully you guys can all see my, my uh, mouse pointing. That dotted line is called the paratrophic membrane. Now I know we're going into a lot of insect terminology here, but it is important. I know that you're gonna remember a paratrophic membrane after the talk today, because it has such a huge impact on the physical properties of your soils on your farm. So stick with me. The paratrophic membrane gets exuded in the gut and actually lines the food that's coming through. Think about if any of you are hunters, I'm a hunter and I like to process my own meat, right? Making sausage or, or jerky or whatever. Pretend that we're making a sausage. And what do you do with the sausage? You put it in a casing. Well, imagine that the food coming through is the meat and this paratrophic membrane is the casing that the, that the meat goes in, right? We're making sausage and it gets exuded, exuded, exuded as the as the food, as that food bolus makes its way down into the guts. And it's, it, it's so cool, this paratrophic membrane has little tiny pores that nutrients are able to go through, but it protects the insects from things like bacteria and viruses and whatnot, right? So we're going through and it eventually, you know what happens to all food, it gets passed out the end as a big old turd, okay? And what's amazing is that because of that paratrophic membrane coating every single turd that most insects send out the back end, they are literally pooping a stable soil aggregate, right? So this turd that comes out of every, every uh, almost every insect in your soil is a mixture of organic matter, microbes, and, you know, small soil particles. And they're all delivered just like a nice brought onto your field, right? And it's just like a little wonderful microbial bomb, okay? So that, that, that stuff is gonna resist erosion. It's going to be like a slow release nitrogen and, 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 uh, and fertilizer for your field. So let's think about this practically. If every time an insect in your field takes a dump and every time that dump is a 
wonderful little stable soil aggregate. Think about what would happen if you're really consciously trying to increase the population of insects living in your soil. Totally cool. I bet you guys didn't know that you're going to be talking about insect turds on a cold Tuesday night, but I'm glad we are. Okay. <clears throat> and, and people are starting to figure this out. Okay. And taking advantage of it. You can go onto Amazon right now and buy insect poop. Okay. And it must be some really good frass, uh, which is another word for insect poop because it's got a super good rating. Okay, awesome. But I'm telling you guys, don't go buy it, grow it, right? Increase your population of insects, get them pooping out there. Okay, we're starting to have fun. All right, so who else are, the, are your employees, right? These free laborers on your farm. We're moving on to some of the more charismatic critters here. These are the predators and the nutrient cyclers. When I look underneath my microscope at some soil that I might have gotten off of one of your very farms, these are the types of, in, of critters right here pictured that I see by far the most of. All right, in the bottom left here, we've got the springtail or a calimbola. They're an incredible creature because they've got this structure called a furcula and they tuck it underneath their bellies. And if they get scared or if a predator comes along, they release it and they go springing, you know, many feet away. It's a wonderful uh, 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 escape device. Here we've got a, a mite. And up here we've got this crazy looking pseudo centipede that's snaking around in the soil water. Um, and what these guys are doing, this group of predators, is they're actually munching up dead plant matter. And a lot of people would not consider them to be a predator, but I do, because what they're after are microbes, okay? And what do, what do creatures do that consume microbes? They release nutrients, okay? So that's why this group of predators, right? The ones that are eating or dead organic matter, you know, organic matter to ingest microbes, uh, uh, bacteria, fungi, protozoans, um, they're releasing those nutrients back into the food cycle, uh, uh, back available for plants to take them up, okay? So again, if you're increasing this population, what would be the result, right? You're gonna see increased nutrient cycling on that farm or on that piece of land. All right, what about the other kind of predators that are out there? All right, we've got a whole host of goofy looking things here now pictured, again, things that I see all the time underneath the microscope. And um, I'm guessing that if many of you would have gotten a, a summer job back in the day and you looked under the microscope and you saw creatures like this, you probably also would have become entomologists. So at least that's what happened to me, right? And these are the predators that are looking for, they're, they're eating each other, right? They're eating some of these critters, the smaller guys. They're taking care of the plants that are consuming, that are trying to get after your crops. And you're probably thinking, all right, what on earth is this creature right here? There's no way this is on my farm. I'm going to lock my doors, hide away, and not come outside if I see anything like that. Actually, this is a, a pseudo scorpion, very common in your soils right here in the Midwest, right? We see them all the time. And what's really neat about them is they've got these pincers out here and they can inject venom into their prey using these pincers, much like a spider does with its, with its fangs. Interestingly, we've got another poison injector right here. Centipedes uh, are, are voracious predators and they also paralyze their prey and start digesting them uh, by, in, by injecting uh, poisons. Okay, this creature up here, one of the more abundant predators in your soils here in the Midwest, it's called a diplurin, and they've actually got a pincer for a butt. And what they do is they chase around all day, every day, looking for these springtails. They're their favorite, favorite food. They grab them with their butt, and then they whip their butt around to their mouth and start eating the trapped uh, calimbola, right, or that springtail. 
right? I'm, it, it's so much fun, you guys, to start thinking about these creatures and the potential to conserve them on farmland when farmers are doing, uh, doing the right things, doing certain things. Last one that I'll talk about down here is this crazy creature right here. This is called the lacewing larvae. And its favorite food in the world are aphids, okay? And how it feeds is it's got these two long hypodermic needles and it walks up to an insect egg or a soft bodied insect such as an aphid and it stabs it with both of these hypodermic needles and sucks out all the juices, okay? So predators, right, are nutrient cyclers and these guys are extremely important free laborers uh, on your farm. I think they should be hired. All right. We also, we can't forget about the seed and weed predators. Okay. The slug up here is on one of my seed cards out in a, in a study plot, and it is munching away the germ of some weed seeds that are, that are pictured here. Okay. Here I've got a blister beetle that's munching on some, I believe, water hemp out in the field really taking care of that, right? So we've got some weed predators and some seed predators. And also most of the ground beetles that you see out there are fantastic weed seed consumers as well. Something that we already spoke a little bit on are the pollinators, okay? And these are a really charismatic creature. We see them more often because they're, they look like little flying teddy bears, right? And they're built that way for a purpose, right? All of these bristly hairs they're able to nab pollen from one flower, deliver it to another flower. And that may sound like a, a, a sort of simple task, or maybe it's, maybe it's not very important for a lot of the crops that we, that we grow, right? Even, even plants like soybeans and sunflowers are self-compatible, right? They don't need to be cross-pollinated, but studies do show that even self-compatible plants like soybeans and sunflowers improve their yield, right? They get a greater yield after they've been pollinated by an animal, by insects, okay? And bring them back to this video that we saw before. Um, I'm trying to incorporate a little bit of insect biology so we can all take away some really interesting things tonight. Uh, the hind legs of a honeybee are really built well for the, the purpose of carrying pollen back to the hive. As you see some of these bees sneak back into the hive, you'll see their back legs are packed with this yellow stuff. And what they do is they visit flowers and they mix some of that pollen that they're gathering with a little bit of nectar and they pack it onto their back legs on this, on this area called the corbicula, right? So they've got a special hairy structure that they pack their pollen on during flight on their way back to the hive. Okay, so I did a little bit of ex an experiment a few years ago because I was quite interested in that question about, um, about whether or not uh, utilizing a seed treatment, right? An insecticidal seed treatment made a difference in attracting pollinators to sunflowers. <clears throat> and I was able to get at the question that we just talked about a little bit earlier as to whether or not pollinators can increase the yield of a self-compatible plant. So let me explain a little bit further. All right, here's the study design. I had three different, uh, three different locations where I did this study. All right, half of the sites were untreated sunflowers, right, no seed treatment at all. The other half were treated with an insecticidal seed treatment. We went out into the field and we collected all insects from top to bottom, right? Um, from, from the soil surface all the way to the top of that, uh, of that sunflower. And what do we find? All right, let me walk through this just a little bit. Don't be intimidated. Here, the pairings here, this, this is one, one location. Okay, this is Brookings, South Dakota in 2013. And the black bar represents the number of bees or pollinators that were visiting untreated seed uh, uh, sunflowers. Okay, 
And at that same location, this is the number of pollinators that were visiting treated sunflowers. Okay, the same thing is here and a, a, a different year, same location. And here, this is out at Dakota Lakes Research Farm, Dwayne Beck out at his place. He had a pretty good pollinator population. Again, left side is the number of bees that we saw visiting untreated or clean sunflowers. The right side uh, or the white bar is the, the bees that were visiting seed treated. So you can see a trend here, right? We take this as three different sites. First site, we had slightly more bees visiting uh, sunflowers that did not have an insecticide. It makes sense. Okay, the next year in Brookings, same thing happened. When we visited Dakota Lakes, we saw a very similar trend. So although that we didn't see this massive difference, it was really interesting that every time we went out and observed this, the bees could intuitively tell, they can sense, right, that um, they can sense most likely chemically that, that uh, when, when a sunflower plant is treated with an insecticide and they avoid that plant, right? And they're preferentially gonna go to a, a plant that does not possess an insecticide. It makes a lot of sense. We don't exactly know how they can tell this, but insects are incredibly sensitive. So what might this mean for our sunflower yield at the end of the season? Well, confirming what we saw before, an increase in the number of visits by pollinators to untreated sunflowers resulted in a slight, right? It's not statistically significant. You know, if I was speaking to my uh, PhD committee, my doctoral committee, they would, they would want to slap my wrist for saying this. But we're talking about on-farm uh, practicality right now, right? And when I see this, I'm noticing that I'm getting a yield bump when I have untreated sunflowers being planted out there. And I think that it may have something to do with the amount of pollinators that are visiting those plants. So interesting stuff. All right, so we, we've been through it, right? We've seen, we've done the interviews. We know that these insects are, are milling about, they're changing our soil. They're, they're tunneling, they're aerating, they're increasing our water infiltration, they're burying organic matter, they're pooping everywhere, which is awesome. They're also pollinating our crops and helping to take care of our pests. So how can we now influence, you know, I'm convinced, I hope you're convinced that these creatures are of vital importance, right? A farm needs to have a healthy and abundant and a diverse insect community if it's going to, if it's going to be a healthy ecosystem, right? If it's going to cycle nutrients well, if it's going to suppress weeds. So how can we influence an insect community on our own farms, right? And the good news is, is that it's actually really easy. And I'm guessing that most everyone on this call, they know exactly what to do and it's really the basics, right? An insect is just like any other organism. If you wanna keep them around, you have to give them a home where they can raise their young, where they can survive year round. Um, we need to give them food, right? They can't survive on, on nothing. And what do insects and other uh, invertebrates eat? Well, their favorite diets are pollen, nectar, and prey. And prey can be anything. You know, I, I even consider prey to be microbes, right? Fungi, bacteria, protozoans, and, uh, and, and finally, it, to not kill them, right? That's, that's the most basic thing that we can do to keep the insects around is to try and, and, uh, and, and get off the jug, right? Or get off the, the seed treatment because we can be doing all other things very well. But if, we, but if we're using things that are targeted to take care of uh, and kill insects, well, they're, they're not gonna be able to survive in that habitat. Right, and I'll be the first one to know that, to, to realize that these pictures, you know, they're just a snapshot, right? These aren't, uh, these aren't pictures from, from Gabe's place, right? These farmers that I'm taking, uh, that, that I'm utilizing these photos from, 
they've got a long way to they're they've got a long way to go right we can still diversify more we can cover the soil more but they're in the right direction and I'll, I'll explain here in a little bit when we go out and look at these fields even after the first year of doing some of these practices we see tremendous differences in the insect community so so what do we do we plant cover crops we plant green right we integrate livestock and animals right we we rest the land we we plant we plant cover crops we we uh, we extend the growing season, right? Continually fixing carbon and nutrients, putting it into the ground because it feeds that soil food web, thus feeding the insect and other invertebrate community. Basically, do things that provide those basic necessities for an organism to live. Right? Here's a photo from from my family farm just a few years ago, and. Honestly, it could be if you put a John Deere on the on Mars, right, or on the moon, that'd be pretty similar to what things look like. Now we can ask ourselves, what on earth type of invertebrate, what type of insect could actually survive in a situation like that? And the answer is, is I'm sure you can tell, right, that the resources aren't there. So um, nothing, the answer is nothing can live there. All right, so let's look at that field a little bit later on in the growing season. So here's a video of a, a corn monoculture. And I want us to start thinking because now hopefully you've learned a little bit more about insects. What type of resources insects require? So start thinking like an insect. What in this habitat can I use to survive? Well, so far in this corn monoculture, I'm not seeing a lot of things that I can use to survive unless I am a corn specialist, right? So a corn specialist is gonna come into this habitat and say, perfect, I've got everything I need to be happy and healthy. And corn specialists are, are what, right? They're corn rootworms, they're European corn borers. Um, they're, they're things that specialize on corn. And those things um, that help us to recycle nutrients to improve soil health don't have the resources they need to uh, have a persistent population in that type of habitat, right? Here's, an Im here's a, a, a quick video. This is what the understory looks like when I, when I ran through it with just a single row between corn rows of a diverse, cover crop mixture right there that's a, an interseeded cornfield okay and we've got mung beans flax cereal rye oats uh, we've got all sorts of things going on in here and a uh, hairy vet um, and throughout the season we've got things flowering right we're providing nectar and pollen for predators we're providing shade on the soil surface keeping it more damp and more cool for insect eggs to survive, right? We're not baking these things. And what, what we're trying to do by, by managing this ecosystem is we're trying to create the basic necessities to promote the beneficial insects, right? The things that we want there, the scary looking predators with the hypodermic needles, right? This is a lady beetle larvae eating pollen and nectar out of a flax flower that's been interceded between corn. I love that image because it embodies what we're after, right? A predator, a voracious predator, eating food that we've provided by, by, um, by designing and maintaining a healthier ecosystem, right? A similar case is this little tiny parasitoid wasp, okay? When people hear the word wasp, they want to run and scream because they don't want their kids to get stung by them, right? Well, um, one of the most diverse groups of insects in the world are these little tiny, teeny tiny wasps. Most of them could probably fit through the eye of a, of a sewing needle. And what they do is they come around, they sniff around for, for soft bodied insects like these aphids. They sneak up to them they stick their stinger into them and they lay an egg. Okay, and a few days and a few weeks later, 
you come back and you find that aphid looking a little bit distraught, right? If it is still alive, it's not in good shape, right? It's definitely not eating very much and it's certainly not laying any more babies. So what I've got here is an image of an aphid and it doesn't look so good, right? This aphid is dead. It was dead when I found it. And it's, it's got this, this creature on the inside of it, right? It's a, it's a half Cheerio looking thing. Well, that's, that's actually not the, the baby of the aphid. What that is, is the baby of the wasp that came and laid an egg on the inside of that aphid. Eating the aphid's guts from the inside out. It is crazy sci-fi wonderful stuff. And I'm so glad that I was able to get an image like that because it shows you sort of the gory realness. Uh, and, and, and it's a symbol of the immense force that we're talking about with this diverse insect community that we're trying to employ on our farms. Okay, so I've talked a heck of a lot about recruiting all these great laborers, all this free labor. But, you know, if I build it, you know, will they really come? And if they do come, you know, are they really doing anything? So let's look at some of the information, some of the data that we've collected uh, uh, over the last couple of years on some of these farms. Okay, so in case study one, we've got corn fields that were interseeded with a seven way mixture of cover crops. Okay, you saw the video just a little while ago. That video was of one of the study fields. We didn't have a cover crop interseeder, so we busted off all of the, the row units of a, of a hay buster no-till drill and slapped them onto a, a cultivator toolbar. And then one of, the, one of the great farmers we work with on a regular basis had these Gandhi seed regulators. And it's crazy, you know, it looks like an octopus rolling through the field, but it, it does the job really well. Um, and this thing has actually gone over quite a few acres now um, since we built it. Um, farmers in our area are asking to use it and using it pretty regularly. It's wonderful to see. Anyway, so in this study, we went out and we interceded in an organic cornfield. Half of the fields were, were bare soil. Half of the fields were interceded with this seven-way cover crop mixture. This is the first year that we had done it. It was tilled in the spring. So what, what do you think might happen in that first field season of interceding cover crops? I thought not very much, okay? So we go out into these fields. This is one of our helpers. This is John Lundgren's daughter, John, Dr. John Lundgren's daughter. She was my helper. And we go out and we collect a bunch of soil cores. And these soil cores here, we use something called a, a golf hole cup cutter. If any of you are dreaming about days where we can go golfing again, when you sink a nice putt, this is the, the device that they use to cut the hole that the golf hole, that the golf ball goes into. Okay, so we go out there, we collect a bunch of soil using this device and we extract all the insects out of the soil. And what do we find? All right, in fields that just had corn, right? Just bare inter-row spaces, I found 12,000 and about 400 invertebrates per meter squared. Now that seems, you know, that, that's kind of hard to imagine, right? So a meter is all oh, three something feet wide by three something feet wide. And then in the top 10 centimeters of soil. But it's a little bit difficult to comprehend. So I made it a little bit easier for us. So my shoe, my boot size is size 12. And I did the math, I did the breakdown. And in this corn monoculture field, every step that I was taking, I was stepping on 422 animals that were just below the soil surface. Now, I think that's pretty amazing in a corn field that was tilled to smithereens in the spring and has just corn growing in it, I was shocked that every step that I took could have that many invertebrates, that many animals below, below every footstep. Okay, but what happens when we add just a simple diversity, right? Seven species, one row in between the corn rows. Okay, we've had a pretty substantial 
increase, right? We went from 12,300 to 17,600 invertebrates per meter squared. And we, when we convert it to the uh, scientific boot method, right? Si Mike's size 12 boot method, right? It's 604 invertebrates every step that I take, which is a 42 and a half percent increase, okay? Again, folks, this is one practice, interseeding cover crops in the first year that we've done it. And we're increasing our soil invertebrate population by 42 and a half percent. Now think back when I was rambling on about all how important it was and how cool it was for all those insects to be pooping everywhere and creating those small stable soil aggregates and little organic matter bombs everywhere. Think about that one single practice. You can have 42 and a half percent more invertebrates constantly pooping, cycling your nutrients all day, every day. They don't sleep. That's pretty cool. And this is, you know, what, what kind of animals am I talking about here? This is a snapshot of what we might get when we tease apart and we extract some of the insects from a soil core, All right? We get weird things like bees that are emerging from, from their larval stages, tiny little creatures and, and beetle larvae, uh, uh, voracious beetles, ant-like beetles, um, all sorts of different larvae. It's a, it's a soup of diverse organisms. All right, case study number two. All right, we're trying to build it. If we build it, will they come? So this case study is, is a study that we're in partnership with Understanding Ag and General Mills. And up in Canada, the last few summers, we've been going out and similarly taking soil samples off of about 50 Canadian farms. Actually, a few of them are down in North Dakota. I can't exclude you guys. Um, and and what, are, what are the characteristics of some of these farms? Almost all of them are no-till. They're employing cover crops. Many of them are using polycultures or interseeding. Some of them are integrating livestock or, or, or interseeding cover crops, things like this. So we have a wide diverse group of, of, um, of, of land managers and a, lot, a wide diverse uh, a smattering of practices. But it's safe to say that everyone we're sampling is on the pathway of, of becoming more regenerative on their farm. Okay, and what have we found so far, right? This is an ongoing study where the numbers keep increasing as we go through soil core and soil core after soil core. But so far, we found almost 250 species, right? And then per meter square, right? these farms are hosting over 30,000 animals per meter square. And to get us on the same level playing field, the Mike size 12 boot method, we're up to 837 animals that I'm stepping on every time I take a, a, a step in these, in these farmers fields. So I hope you're happy. Um, anyone that's on the call from Canada, you guys are winning the race right now, okay? Um, it, it's really, it's quite incredible. Some of the farms that we're getting on to see their, their trajectory over the last few years, how they've changed. Um, it's, it's incredible. And as, as the numbers prove, they're headed in the right direction, right? Can you imagine the amount of physical change happening in their soil when they're hosting that many animals in that amount of space? Think of the organic matter Think of the tunneling, the bioturbation, the mixing of soil aeration, and think about those turds. Mm, we'll all be thinking about turds tonight when we fall asleep. So we attracted some bugs, right? It's impressive. Every time we step out there in some of these fields, we're up over 800 insects or sorry, uh, animals uh, below each one of our feet. So do they actually do any good? Okay. Are we just inviting them to the party? Um, are they freeloading? Are they actually doing us any good? So to do this, we can, we do a number of, of tests, but I'll just explain one of them here. 
because I'm starting to run a little bit short on time. And one of them is to figure out whether or not the insects that we're attracting to these farms by utilizing all the regener regenerative principles, are we attracting more predators, right? Beneficial insects that are, that are out there consuming things that, are, that we might consider a pest, right? They're, they're, they're perhaps uh, looking to, to consume our, our crop plants, okay? So is the predator activity increasing when we utilize some of these regenerative practices. And we test this by taking a little, a, you know, a poor little moth larvae, a wax moth larvae. We pin it through its butt down to a clay ball, a piece of clay. And then we bury that clay ball so that the insect is presented right at the soil surface. Then we leave for an hour, right? All it takes is an hour. And then we come back and we sneak up on these insect larvae and we see how many of them have been eaten, how many of them are currently being eaten and who's eating them, All right? So sometimes we come back and we see somebody actively chewing at the buffet here, okay? We've got this big carabid beetle uh, munching down its free lunch. And once in a while, we'll come back to just a, a, a horrible gut pile scene here, right? Something out of a horror film. And here's a little video of, of what it looks like when we see a really happy beetle that's found one of our little free meals here. Okay, so he's pretty happy. One more pair of, of ground beetles here. These are, okay. um, um, what kind of beetles are these? The green ones. Um, the last one was a pterostichus. These are uh, not Harpalus, but they're probably Luca blondus. Anyways, they're really cool little ground beetles and they're voracious predators. Their mandibles are like, are like razor blades, okay? So, all right, we went out um, in fields that were interseeded and not interseeded, okay? So when I, when I bring up the table here, the bar on the left will be the, the percentage of larvae that we set out there that were consumed, right, or preyed upon when it was just corn, just corn in monoculture. On the right side will be the percentage of larvae that were eaten uh, when we had cover crops interseeded into the corn, right? And so uh, it's a pretty robust sample size. We did over a thousand observations. And, you know, I expected that you know, when we provide cover crops, sure, we're going to get some more insects, some more predators probably. And, and I would hope that it'd be a little bit of a bump in our overall predation rate. What I did not expect is to have almost exactly twice as many predation events happen when we had a simple cover crop mixture growing below the corn. Okay, so almost half of all the larvae we set out in, in cornfields where we had a cover crop growing were consumed in an hour, right? Whereas coming back after an hour in the corn monoculture, it was less than a quarter of those, of those um, individuals, okay? And I just wanted to share a quick story. When I was doing this study, I was out in one of my corn monoculture fields and going down the line and I couldn't figure out what was going on. I had all of these larvae pinned up, stuck into clay balls. I set them out and after an hour I came back and every single one of the clay balls was dug out of the ground and the, the larvae was missing. And this was in a corn monoculture. So I, I was thinking, what on earth is going on? What sort of predator is so voracious that it's coming through and gobbling up all these things and destroying everything? And as I entered one of my rows, I peered down and I saw a rooster pheasant working slowly ahead of me, gobbling up every single um, uh, larvae that I had put out the hour previous. So, but don't worry, I got revenge on him. Okay, so let's review a bit. All right, invertebrates are this crazy force of nature, right? They are more abundant 
They're massive. They're, they're mass, if you weigh them, is more than all other animals on the earth put together. Right? They're by far the most diverse group of, organ, of animals on the face of the earth. And they're absolutely ready and willing to work for cheaply uh, on, on your farms, as long as we are being proactive in considering and following a regenerative path um, and providing them with the, the basic necessities that they need. And they're absolutely capable of transforming your farm and in a very short, quick amount of time. So I know this was kind of a whirlwind. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, learn some new things about insects um, and learn some new things about how just a few things changing on your farm can have a tremendous impact on the, on the abundance and the activity of those insects on your farm. And with that being said, you guys, I think we have some time now for, uh, for questions. So I'll have Gabe come on and, and start asking a couple questions. Thank you, Mike. That, that was excellent. And yes, we are getting a lot of questions. So I'll start right in. This Adam wants to know, what's the mode of action that a treated seed would cause to kill that many insects? He wants to know, is the plant then affecting the insects after the plant's growing or is it through the soil? Okay. That's an excellent question, and it's one I get really pumped about because I've got a one, one of one of my biggest passions is is understanding how these insecticides work when we do put them out in an environment. Because here's a little a little factoid: it's known that when we put these seeds out onto the landscape, can you see that, Gabe? Were you able to see that? Sure can. Right. When, when one of these seeds is planted, and that plant germinates and starts to grow between two and 20 percent of the insecticide active ingredient makes it into the plant that is treated two to 20 percent which leaves 80 to 98 percent of the insecticide going everywhere else right so that's a top that's a discussion for another time figuring out where else it goes the question at hand is what happens to the stuff that actually enters the plant itself. And I had a slide uh, that I was questioning putting on here and I didn't and I wish I had now. But when an insect encounters this type of insecticide, the neonicotinoid insecticide, it impacts a regular, the regular nerve function of an insect. So let's say I am thirsty right now. My brain is gonna send a message to my hand to move my muscles to pick up my mug of water, okay? If I was intoxicated by a neonicotinoid insecticide, it would block the different pathways of nerves, right? It would block the message from my brain to the muscles that need to flex. And it would actually cause my muscles to perpetually flex. It would not allow my brain to continually send messages and allow my body to act in a way that I want it, right? So an insect that is intoxicated with the neonicotinoid insecticide, essentially their brains can't send messages to their muscles to, to do what that insect needs it to do, right? And very oftentimes an insect will be paralyzed, right? Unable to move its muscles or its organs um, and it will be either, you know, stuck in the sun and dried out and die, or more likely it just won't be able to move around well enough in order to attain nutrition. It starves to death. So that's, and I wish I would have had my, my, um, my slide up there, but in a nutshell, it, it blocks one nerve talking to another nerve, sending a message from your brain down to the muscle. Okay. So it blocks that junction between one nerve and another nerve, which is so vitally important for those to be able to talk to each other. But that's the mode of action. All right, thank you. Farmer Donna wants to know where she can find materials to help her students understand and love insects. Oh man, <laughs> um, great question. Um, there are, oh man, 
Uh, that's, that's a, that's a, that could be a rabbit hole, but, uh, YouTube go YouTube like crazy. Um, get yourself, um, a good insect identification guide, uh, because they typically have wonderful little snippets about the biologies of the different types of, of insects and other, um, invertebrates that we encounter on a really regular basis, especially those ones that we find out in a garden. Um, those are places that I would, that I would start. And there's a website that is all things insects. It's called bugguide.com. I think it's bugguide.com. Bug bug Just Google bug guide, bug guide and you'll, you'll get into it. Okay. Thank you. Raimundo is from the Dominican Republic and he wants to know about white flies, how to control them with what? Right, white flies. Um, white flies are a, a phloem, phloem feeding insect or phloem or xylem. Anyways, they're a piercing sucking insect. So what they do is they come up to a plant and they insert their needle-like mouth part into a plant and they, they suck out the juices. Um, what I would do is increase the number of plants that you have in this area that um, that possess that possess pollen and nectar, because uh, white flies are a incredible sort of helpless little morsel of food when it comes to a beneficial predatory insect, especially those guys that I was talking about with the needle-like mouth parts. They love white flies; they'll gobble them up like crazy. But they're those those types of insects are really attracted to areas that have bright uh, aromatic flowers that uh, that possess pollen and nectar in my own garden um you know after i get a lot of the veggies planted my favorite thing is to cut is to go down the aisles um and pick up the most vibrant weird looking things and put a smattering of nectar possessing flowers just all over the garden it works works really well right very good another question is it true that Ivamec used on cattle can influence whether dung beetles lose their wings or have other negative side effects? Okay, Ivamec in cattle. What I, uh, I, I don't know about the, the wing thing. I have not heard of that. I'll have to ask uh, one of the fellow uh, scientists I work with who's a dung beetle expert. What I can tell you is that Ivamex um, are extremely hard on dung beetle populations. Right? Dung beetles, their biology is such that they are a more long-lived insect and their population, once it's established, is incredibly beneficial because they aerate and spread out turds like crazy, you know, dung like crazy. And they also are predators of things like a, a fly larvae uh, and maggots inside a dung pat. Um, so their activity, their, their lifespan takes a while to build up, but once it's there, it's extremely beneficial. Once you use an, uh, a, a wormer, um, it knocks that population out so quickly, leaving the types of insects whose biologies are so rapidly developing that they can oftentimes develop resistance to those types of insecticides. Um, and, and those types of, of rapidly developing insects are the filth flies that, that can give um, ranchers some trouble. If you can avoid, you have to avoid using those types of, uh, of products if you're going to establish a population of dung beetles. Another question about uh, natural fertilizers, for instance, garlic and cinnamon. Do they have negative impacts on insects? Um, yeah, it's, uh, that's a good question. Um, things that are extremely aromatic, right, um, such as garlic or cinnamon might be, can influence how well an insect might perceive its environment. Okay, if you remember back to early on in the presentation when I was still really nervous, you saw the, the feather-like antennae of the male mosquito. Okay, and, and 
obviously that type of organism um, gets around and acquires what it needs by smelling, right? That's what antennae are for is, is by collecting that information all around them. And they're looking for something very specific. And when an insect um, is around an especially aromatic plant that can hinder how well, uh, how, how efficient they are in finding uh, a host plant, for example. Um, and this type of, uh, of you know, uh, integrated uh, pest management, if you will, um, is used all the time, right? Companion cropping, utilizing marigolds in the garden, uh, uh, planting tomatoes uh, next to carrots, uh, um, dill, uh, they, are, they all have extremely potent smells, which, which giving them off makes it really difficult for, for some pests to actually find the plant that they're looking for and consume it. So, um, you know, I, I, I don't know specifically about some of these products, for example, but I know when you have a diverse plant community, it makes it really hard on um, insects to try and find and hone in on their on their host plant, right? So when we're talking about a agricultural field, diversification goes a long way in preventing a corn rootworm from finding a corn plant, for example. Okay. Uh, Adam has a question about the sunflower trials with the treated and untreated. Was there any consideration given to whether the larger insect population actually fed blackbirds or other birds and kept them from eating the sunflowers themselves? Ah. That's a really excellent question. Um, one, that I, the one that probably deserves to be answered um, through another study. What I, what I would say is that we're just starting to figure out how well insects can perceive whether or not a plant has been treated with an insecticide. Um, and I have no clue how well, or if, if, a, if a bird would be able to uh, a, obtain the information as to whether or not uh, a plant is, has been treated with an insecticide or not. But what I do know is that um, when you do have that uh, immense healthy insect community, the other, the other trophic, the, the trophic ladder soon follows after, right? When you have a healthy microbe community, it feels the protozoans and the, and the nematodes, the insects follow, right? Where the insects go, the birds go. So what, what I can say is understand your healthy and diverse soil food web, and then you'll really be able to tell, uh, you know, how to attract uh, birds to your to your, to your fields. And it's a good practice to do. I've been to a lot of small farms where they do everything that they can to try and promote the um, nesting birds on their place to take care of some of those caterpillar pests. Yeah. Uh, that ties right into a question we have from Guy who asks, in my effort to attract tree swallows, bluebirds, and purple martins, am I hurting my, my efforts to increase the good bugs? I don't think so. At least I hope not, because I do the same thing. Um, my my garden out front here, um, I put up, you know, uh, little little low lying wires so that you know finches can perch on. I've got bird feeders uh, right outside the garden, um, and I want them to to be perusing in my garden. Um, you know, birds are, are are part of that community. They're part of that ecosystem. They're targeting in on, sure, they're going to be eating some of my beneficial insects. They're also going to be eating some of those, you know, quote unquote, pests that are after my potatoes, my, my, my corn, whatever. But I, I want those birds there consuming, you know, beneficials and, and quote unquote pests because birds are pooping there. And, and guess what? There's, there's insects that are, you know, bird dung specialists. So without birds in there, um, I'm not getting that diverse community of, of microbes or uh, and of uh, insects that I want in my garden. Yep, they're an important part of the ecosystem. Don has a question that many are asking, 
what type of microscope would you recommend in order to look at these insects and are they affordable? Oh man, um, you know, I'm not looking every day to check out prices of microscopes. Um, the answer is if you, if you get something, here's a better answer. Um, my, microscopes are cool. And, and if you, if you have the, the funds to do, to do it, get yourself a nice, um, dissecting microscope, um, that goes up to about 50 X or something like that. And, uh, you don't have to spend a ton of money. Um, make sure that you get a good light source. Lighting is half the battle. Just get the you know light source that comes in and you can adjust the brightness of, of your light. Um, look for reviews online. I don't wanna go out on a limb and, and recommend one type of microscope or not. But what I can recommend is you can get um, cameras now that connect to uh, blue, via Bluetooth to your phone and they're actually uh, sort of a, a dissecting microscope um, that you can utilize and, and manipulate and look right down in soils and at different critters and look at the image on your phone and take pictures. So that's a really cool thing and those aren't very expensive. Um, I recommend those, L look into that. You can use that right out in the field too. Okay, here's a question several are asking. Can I have my own abundant insect population when I am surrounded by farms that use insecticides and farm conventionally? Yeah, um, yes, you can. Um, you can, the, the community, as we have found and really been quite amazed by, um, is so um, uh, responsive to even the slightest thing that a farmer is doing on their place. So will, will that community be affected by a neighbor? Sure, most likely, you know, if they're out spraying for aphids, you could get some, uh, some drift um, and that does happen, but you shouldn't be afraid of investing in some of these opportunities to expand your invertebrate community, to harness those benefits by what your neighbors are doing. Some of the studies that I've done in the past have been on fairly small <laughs> bits of land completely surrounded by conventional uh, egg. And somehow, I don't know how, but if you do build it, those insects get there, right? Insects are extremely mobile. Um, and what's totally cool is that uh, they can travel miles, right? There, there's insects that are raining on us all the time, things that are stuck up in the jet stream that are falling down, raining from the sky. Biology rains. And, and if we just make a home for them, it will get there. You know, even dung beetles and some of these other beetles that are able to, or flies that fly for miles and miles, we look at them underneath the microscope and they'll have little mites hitchhiking on them from place to place, little phoretic mites that are grabbing onto the hair of a bee for dear life, looking for a lift to, to the next place. So don't be worried about being a, on it, uh, you know, an island surrounded by a conventional ag, you can do it. Yes, and speaking from experience, every one of the panelists on tonight can tell you, each of us is on an island and, and we have increased insect populations on our farms and ranches. William asks, will there ever be a point where there are too many insects or will using these methods take care of the problem itself? Okay, so what we're looking for here in ecology, we utilize the term climax community, okay? And you can look up what that is on your own. Uh, basically what a climax community is, is think of an old growth forest, or better yet, something we might be more familiar with, is look at, look at a, a prairie that's really managed well. And you never ever see an insect outbreak in that type of community. And that is because the, uh, the, the, uh, the food web, right? The checks, the system of checks and balances that are happening in that diverse and stable community are, are, are so in tune that the second that one insect population 
raises, there's another insect population or, uh, or, 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 or a, a disease or a food shortage that reacts in a way which corrects the imbalance, right? So populations of insects in a climax community, same with plants, same with microbes, are doing this, right? That's when you know you've reached your climax is when the population is riding this wave and you're not having big upswings and then big drops, right? You want this sort of steady eddy system. And that's what we're looking for in a, in a super healthy ecosystem. Yep, very good. I have a question here. Uh, this pertains to the weather. How do insects survive in our cold Northern climates? Great question. Um, another slide that I thought about putting on tonight. You, that's the trouble you guys, is insects are too cool and too diverse and too abundant for, for a, a one hour webinar, right? So we just, we took tonight, we took the survey of insects. But uh, to your question, insects um, very oftentimes will survive the winter in a cold climate um, as, as an egg or as a larvae, a lot of times buried into the soil where they have some sort of, or even, even as an adult, less often as an adult, but more often as an egg or a larvae, they'll bury themselves into a tree, you know, into some plant residue or down into the soil. And, and that does insulate them some, but you're probably thinking, well, the frost reaches down pretty far and, and insects don't go that far down. But insects have this incredible ability. It's absolutely wonderful to pump their bloodstream full of antifreeze. Okay, it's a, it's a, a um, if you think about when you, if you take water, a pan of water out in a, on a cold day, it, it freezes, you know, fairly quickly. If you take that same pan of water and you mix in a whole bunch of salt and sugar, it takes a heck of a lot longer uh, and a heck of a lot colder temperatures for that water to freeze. Well, insects have this crazy ability to break down all these complex sugars into their, in their body into simple sugars. And what that does is increases right, the sweetness of the Kool-Aid that is their blood and makes it almost impossible for them to freeze at, uh, at the temperatures that we, see, um, that we see around here. In fact, if you go out onto the prairie right now, despite being you know, the last couple of days of negative 20 degrees here in my neck of the woods, I could probably go out and cut open some goldenrod galls and find little um, um, uh, fly larvae uh, squirming around in there. It's what ice fishermen used to uh, use before they could go to the bait store uh, and, and pick up uh, waxworm larvae. They'd be hunting out in the prairie for these um, insects that were still kicking in the dead of winter. Wow. I'm gonna direct the next question to Alan because I know Alan has some experience with this. Patty is located in East Texas and has primarily Bermuda monoculture pastures. And she's wondering, do armyworms benefit our land? They can come in and devour our pastures in August. Alan? Well, Patty, that's a great question. Uh, and I saw your follow-up uh, comment there where you said that your pastures are predominantly uh, monoculture Bermuda grass. Uh, so, you know, that's basically what you've done is you've provided an environment that army worms love. Uh, you know, when you see army worms uh, entering into fields and, and becoming highly dominant and devouring those fields, it's typically going to be a very low diversity or monoculture type field. And so one of the best ways to help combat those army worms naturally is through encouraging and establishing far greater diversity into those pastures. The other thing that we have noted, and I did a series of studies a few years back where we looked at the differences in plant bricks and what we found in side-by-side in -side comparisons was that in fields that where the plants had significantly higher bricks, typically 12% bricks and higher, we had virtually no armyworm predation whatsoever. But in fields where the bricks was low, it was single digit, uh, the armyworms would be highly prevalent. 
and it was as if you had an invisible wall between the fields. The army worms would, would come right up to the fields that were high bricks, but you would find very, very few in those fields. So, so high bricks helps a lot, and that is predominantly established by building your soil, microbial population, and nutrient cycling capability, and building diversity into those pastures or fields will also help significantly in reducing armyworm predation. Thank you, Alan. Um, Mike Lynn asks, how significant is the impact of granivores in decreasing weed populations? Um, <clears throat> I don't, I'm not gonna be able to give you a, a, a certain percentage because it really does vary based on the ecosystem that, that one is, is providing. But uh, what I will say is that seeds, weed seeds uh, especially are, well, seeds in general are like this wonderful little packet full of nutrition. And when an insect finds one available on the soil surface, a cricket, a slug, a ground beetle, a millipede, they want that nutrition, okay? And if you have an abundant uh, a community of surface dwelling invertebrates, those weed seeds are gobbled up quickly because it's just too important of a resource for insects to not take advantage of. Yep. I will just add, Lynn, if you want to uh, Google Dr. Randy Anderson. Dr. Randy Anderson did some really good work on granivores and insects in South Dakota. And you can find that online. Mike Glenn asks, what power lens do you use to view the invertebrates and do you use covers on the slides? Um, okay, so this, this guy here um, is a microscope that goes up to 80X total but it's sort of the, it's a Cadillac. Um, I would say a, a 50, 60 X is, is, is more than what a, is, is more than needed. Uh, you need something up to 80 X if you wanna do, you know, if you're counting the hairs on the bottom of a foot of an insect or something like that to, to identify it. Um, so, you know, shoot for 60 X or so, that'd be fine. Um, and the other part of the question was, um, I can't quite remember. Yeah, oh, a slide, that, that a slide. Was the cover slide. Right, nope, nope. Uh, for a dissecting scope, no. Uh, we're oftentimes looking at insects that are, that are too large to put underneath uh, a slide. Some of the images that I used for this presentation uh, were of insects that were very small and back at our home lab, we just got a new toy that uh, takes, that is a, a microscope and it takes a picture, like hundreds of pictures and layers them so that you can see an insect in focus at all of its layers from top to bottom. Whereas typically on a microscope, you have to adjust uh, which part of the insect is in focus at once, which is why a lot of the, the pictures are pretty cool. But no, using a slide, um, the insects that we're looking at, um, even the smallest ones are too large. They'd most likely get uh, smushed by a slide. Okay. Alice asks, do herbicides used to kill weeds also kill insects? Yes. The short answer is yes. There's different, uh, you know, there's all sorts of different herbicides out there, but there has been plenty of research uh, as of late on um, the negative effects of herbicides on insects. And the, the mode of action um, is still yet quite not teased out, I think, for a lot of, uh, of herbicides. Um, it, might, it might not even be some of the active ingredients that we're looking for, but rather some of the things that are used as a tank mixture for an herbicide that are, that are acting against insects. Some of the oils and surfactants that can mess with the exoskeleton of an insect. Those are the types of things that, that might actually be causing harm to the, to the insects, right? There are also a lot of, a lot of herbicides um, are uh, um, 
are antibiotics, right? So they, they, they really smoke a, an in, or a, a, a microbial community and a bacterial community, right? Insects, like other animals, are a walking sack of, of bacteria. And if that bacterial community is knocked out, they're not able to digest the food that they, um, that they need, right? So that also might be a mode of action too. Good question. Good. Uh, I'll call on Alan or Doug for this next one. Is there a predatory insect specifically effective on barber pole worms? Alan or Doug, do you happen to know that? Well, the first thing that I would say is that, you know, you can look at adding other species that are dead in host. Uh, you know, so for instance, you have uh, cattle are dead in host to the internal parasites of sheep and goats and vice versa. So adding additional species is dead in host and even adding poultry into the situation can help as well. Doug, anything to add? Um, no, that, that'd be about it, I guess. Okay, thank you. David Kleinschmidt, I'll call on you here. Uh, any recommendations on cover crops that would be more beneficial than others in attracting insects? You know, kind of like what Mike was talking about, a lot of the different flowering um, plants at different times are just absolutely beneficial. I mean, we're talking in the warm season, you know, sunflower, sun hemp, uh, mung beans, cow peas, um, some of the different, um, oh, flax and stuff like that work really great. And then in the springtime, um, you know, which is planted in the fall using some uh, winter peas, vetches, uh, different clovers. Uh, there's a lot of different things out there. There's a, there's a ton of species that can be used. Yep. Facelia is another good one. Mike, do you have anything to add there that you're seeing? No, a lot of those species were really great. In my own uh, interseeding study, I can just comment that I was really happy with the partnership, uh, I, I guess, synergism between the, the peas, which were the first thing to bloom. Um, and then I was very surprised and, and uh, happy to see that the flax you know, underneath the corn canopy in a shaded situation uh, became almost an indeterminate uh, flower. So it was periodic throughout the, the whole season. The goal to keep in mind is that um, you want to have a mixture of plants with varying uh, 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 flowering times, right? The idea is to have consistent um floral resources there for pollinators and, and other uh, beneficials. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons I really like hairy vetch, it being indeterminate, it's flowering mm -hmm. a long, long time. Right, yeah, insects, and even like, uh, you'll yeah, be surprised to know, I read not long ago, you know, spiders eat pollen, you know, weird things. So, so it, all sorts of predators, um, just because we, we frequently call them predators, that doesn't mean that they can't survive for very long periods of time or, or complete their entire life cycle by consuming pollen and nectar. Wow. So Daniel asked, podworms in beans are why he finds himself spraying an insecticide. Any recommendations to increase predators that would take care of podworms? Right. Um, that's a, it's a good question. Uh, I'm not too familiar with the, with podworms, um, but uh, something I, I noticed uh, this past year, I was able to be fairly regularly observing a bean field that was planted, um, planted into green. Uh, it was, it was a cereal rye field and granted this spring, it was, oh, I shouldn't say it was a monoculture. There was, there was some red clover and, uh, and primarily cereal rye. And those plants were because of the green bridge that was established. Um, it was incredible how much more healthy those plants were than, than beans that were planted um, into a, you know, some, a soil that had had the, the restart button pushed. 
And, and we talk a lot about predators controlling insects. One of the most important predators that we don't think about very often, um, but actually they, they might kill more insects than, than other insects is fungi, is fungi. And in order to have healthy populations of fungi, creating that green bridge where you've always got a living root in the ground and, and, and fungi populations can grow and be there and be persistent, um, that's gonna be more opportunity for those fungi to infect insect hosts, okay? There's, there's certain research out there that says aphids, for example, there's more aphids that are killed by fungus than, than insects, okay? So um, that's something to keep in mind is that microbial community is not only so important for nutrient cycling, but it also really knocks back insect populations whose, pop, whose populations have grown too large. Wow, that's really interesting. All the more reason for no-till, more yeah. reason for planting species such as flax that are highly mycorrhizal. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Here's a question. What benefits do stink bugs have? <laughs> benefits do stink bugs have? Um, you know, it's, it's funny. We talked about the mosquito at the beginning of the talk here. And uh, every entomologist gets a question almost on a daily basis. What are mosquitoes good for? And uh, so it's, it's always interesting to sort of, you know, take a moment to think exactly what services these different insects are providing in an ecosystem. And stink bugs, we have to be thinking about, there are many, many different species of stink bugs. Some are very predatory. Right? They will gobble up soft-bodied caterpillars like it's going out of style. Other stink bugs that are uh, herbivores, right, they're consuming plant tissue. Well, in their native habitat, they are an important uh, player in making sure that certain plant species aren't becoming um, overly abundant in that diverse plant community, right? So plant, uh, insects that consume plants, you know, they, they can be the bane of a farmer's existence sometimes, but we need to remember that in a situation where the where mother nature wants the land to be in right this healthy diverse stable community herbivores are an absolute invaluable tool to make sure not one uh, plant species becomes overly abundant yep thank you jason asks he's just getting started on the regenerative path what can he do to start down this path jason take a look at your screen i'll put in a shameless plug for Regen Ag 101. It, it's well worth the investment and it'll get you to started down the right path in regenerative ag. So Shane, I'm gonna call on you for this one. Charlene asked, in the corn plus corn cover crop scenario, how long after corn planting did you plant the cover crop? Shane, you experienced quite a bit of this. Care to hop in? Yeah, I mean, we see guys doing it <clears throat> V4, V5 stage. I mean, <clears throat> I just want to be a little cautious. You know, when you start implementing a new practice, start small and establish your learning curve. Uh, understand what your mixes are going to be. You know, definitely if you're <clears throat> early on in your regenerative path and your soil health may not be there and you have to come back in with a herbicide for some unknown reason, um, you know, we want to be cautious about that because you guys are out there and make the investment of time and money you know, putting a cover crop in and you have to come in and knock most of it out with the herbicide due to, you know, weeds, um, you know, so start small, get a learning curve established and start advancing your soil health. Just focus on your principles, get that soil covered. Let's start there first and yep. then start moving on up from there. Thank you, Shane. Uh, Lucas, I'm going to have David Kleinschmidt type you an answer on your question there. Uh, here's a good question, Mike. Willie asks, do the neonicotinoids create the same mode of action that could induce autoimmune reactions in human beings? Um, uh, it's a good question. I know there's not been a lot of research 
um, direct research uh, with the effects of neonicotinoids on the human body. There are some studies that, that, that do correlations um, between um, people that are more likely to be exposed to neonicotinoids and, and, and certain health, um, health, detrimental health effects. And the research that I've seen um, looking at pesticide applicators in particular, um, it's, not, it's not real good. Okay, so there's some really interesting studies out there that show cancer rates of pesticide applicators being off the charts and whatnot. So neonicotinoids specifically, what I can say is that when I spoke about the mode of action, right, we've got one nerve needing to send a message to the next nerve, you know, and, the, and that's the way the brain tells a muscle what to do or a gland to, to squeeze and release a hormone, right? We need those nerves to be firing when the brain tells it to, okay? And the insect has this very, you know, this, this, this kind of junction here, this, this gap between their nerves that has to be bridged with uh, something called a neurotransmitter, right? It's a chemical that just makes sure that the, the message is, is continually being sent. And the type of neurotransmitter that's used and the type of receptors on insect nerves are the same um, neurotransmitters and the same receptors that birds, fish, mammals possess, okay? So we have a central nervous system and that messaging pathway looks very, very similar um, in insects and, and also in us. And there are certain case studies, oh uh, boy, it's grisly to read them, but uh, force feeding um, birds, you know, chickens, quail, uh, uh, force feeding them, um, treated seeds and then monitoring what happens. Basically they, they become lethargic and paralyzed for a time and they eventually do recover. But for a wild animal um, to be passed out and paralyzed for a time usually means death for a wild animal. There's also some really grisly studies of farmers uh, that I, I looked at these for my PhD to make sure I, I brushed up on it. But there are, there are instances where farmers have attempted suicide by uh, consuming neonicotinoids. Um, and it, then there, and they do have some pretty, yeah, awful, horrible <laughs> reactions. So just because it's called an insecticide doesn't mean that it's specific for insecticides. Thank you. Here we have a question. Hi, I don't want to sound greedy, but money wise, what are the benefits considering, and they're talking about the sunflower trials, considering that yield was not significantly higher? And if I may, Mike, I'll just start on that one. The, the issue there is that that was only looking at yield. We have to think when we move into regenerative ag, we have to start looking at the whole. As Mike so well explained, this is also about the insects themselves becoming fertilizer, the insects aerating the soil, changing the amount of water infiltration in the soil, changing actually the amount of carbon in the soil, which will affect water holding capacity. Also, if you'd go through and look at profitability at understanding ag, we, we always like to say we focus on profit, not yield. There, there would be a much larger difference. So Mike, do you wanna comment on yeah. that? Yeah, yep. and, and hopefully I explained it correctly, but on that graph, um, what, what ended up happening is that when we did not have, so when we had sunflower seeds that were treated, we actually had a not significant, but a slight decrease in yield compared to seeds that did not have a pesticide on them, right? And we think that those clean seeds, those untreated seeds yielded slightly better was because of that extra animal pollination that we were receiving from the bees. So not only did we see um, a non-significant increase in yield by not utilizing the neonicotinoid seed treatment, when we think about the economics, we also didn't have to pay for that too. So if I had gone further to look at uh, yield uh, um, um, net 
net income at the end of the year, I would have also been able to factor in that I spent less money on those seeds on that seed treatment um, in the in the fields that did not have a, a seed treatment, right? So not only did they did they have a little bit better yield, I also didn't have to pay for the seed treatment. I also didn't have to kill my bugs. Yeah. Question from Jerry in the predator study, and I'm assuming he's talking about where you pinned the yeah. the uh, wax worms to the soil. What percentage of the seeds were naked when planted? So um, in those, in the, in the study where I, um, where I looked at predators, uh, one of the requirements for all of the fields that I did that on was that they uh, did not have an insecticidal seed treatment. So no insecticide could be used in those fields. That was the requirement. And also, um, so some of them could have uh, uh, be genetically modified, but no chemical insecticide was treated to those fields at any time, either through the seed treatment or through a spray. And, and it's a very, very good question. It, and it, I did a follow-up study because I was wondering the same exact thing. If I planted a cover crop, a mixture of cover crops right down the middle of two treated corn rows, am I just attracting insects to this resource just for them to encounter nectar and pollen that's been tainted with a neonicotinoid insecticide? So the summer after uh, the, the study I, I talked about, I did that. I, I planted the same cover crop mixture down the middle, 15 inches away from the left-hand corn row, 15 from the right. And throughout the whole season, I collected cover crop tissue. And uh, I wanted to look and see, okay, is the insecticide making its way from the corn seed into, the, into these cover crops that I'm hoping are attracting beneficial insects? I looked at cereal rye tissue and flax tissue. And throughout the entire season, I was able to quantify neonicotinoids moving from the corn into those interseeded cover crops. So that's one of those basic uh, things. You know, we build the home for them. We, we provide the food for them. And all of that can be for naught if, we are, if, we're, if, if we're utilizing a pest management practice that doesn't jive with everything else that we're trying to do. Right, right. Alan, I'm gonna point this question to you. How long do wor dewormers, et cetera, stay in manure and are they benign after a composting process? So first of all, uh, dewormers can uh, stay in the system, so to speak, and the residue and all of that and impact dung beetle populations for quite some time. We have, we have noted that uh, after dewormers were used, uh, then you will have a very negative impact on dung beetle populations for uh, at least six to eight months and a lot of times even longer. And with most people using dewormers at least once or twice annually, uh, you see little to no dung beetle populations on, on many of those operations. Uh, and what was the second part of the question, Gabe? Yeah, is it benign after it's been composted? Well, that's a good question. Um, and, you know, I guess I would, if you're, if you're not grazing the animal, uh, then I'm not quite sure why they're deworming. Uh, but uh, so in the only place I know to pick up manure like that that you would compost is going to be in more of a feedlot type situation or dry lot type situation. Um, but I, I, I do not know the answer to that. I do not know how long it, it would uh, remain, you know, viable as, as a residue toxic to dung beetles after a composting. If, if one of our other folks, panelists, knows that answer, please speak up. Here's a good question for you, Mike. Uh, this person is not a farmer, but a home gardener. They're a bit disheartened as to how few flowering plants there are that have not been treated with neonex. Do you think neonex will ever be phased out in the US? 
I do. Yep. I think, huh, I actually think that it's uh, not too far into the future where that will happen. Um, I know that certain agencies, for example, are, are starting to, if they, you know, public lands and whatnot, are, they, they aren't using them anymore. They can't use them anymore. Um, when I ask myself this question, I, I go to look at the, the industry, actually. I look at the chemical industry. And what I'm seeing is um, the replacements, so the neonicotinoid replacements, um, starting to become more abundant and more popular. And to me, that tells me that industry is seeing the writing on the wall for neonicotinoid insecticides. There's just too much information now that's coming out. I get alerts every day in my email about a new study that's coming out that's quantifying neonicotinoids in you know, our, our own laboratory. We quantified them in white-tailed deer, in predator populations, in wild, uh, in wildflowers in the middle of uh, uh, wa uh, waterfowl production areas. Every um, every well, every well, uh, every sample of well water that was tested in rural Minnesota in, in ag counties, um, there's there's a study that's uh, still under review. I saw a release on it. Um, tested positive for neonicotinoid insecticides. So there's just too much information coming out too quickly for me to believe that neonics will hang on for much longer. There'll definitely be a fight for it, um, probably for long enough. Uh, they'll probably fight for long enough, um, just long enough until the, the, the replacement can be uh, brought out, sad to say. Hopefully by then, We'll all be practicing regenerative ag. So, absolutely. Yep. Sarah, uh, excuse me, Susan asks With honeybees, is there a reduction in varroa mites and other diseases as you transition to regenerative agriculture? Well, that's a great question. Um, bees, are, bees are, of course, a tricky one. And what I can say in terms of regenerative agriculture, um, Bees are, like all other organisms, a product of their diet. And bees also can select if they have the correct diversity, you know, the, the plethora of diversity of plants within the habitat that they're residing in. They can select certain plants that provide medicinal uh, properties to them, right? That's, that's been documented. They, if, they are, if they have a certain ailment, they will select certain types of plant nectar in order to correct that ailment. So what I can say is that most likely due to the diversity of the diet that, um, that honeybees are subject to in a landscape where regenerative agriculture has been adopted, um, it really lends itself well for them to be able to fight off diseases and pests on their own. Right? They're utilizing the chemistry of nature um, to, and, and their own evolutionary uh, know-how, I guess, uh, to take some of those properties and utilize them against pests. So yes, I do believe, I know that's not, the, the research isn't, is not out yet. I know that's coming. But what I can say is, is that, that if you, if you build a diverse ecosystem and give them choices, they are healthier individuals, they're healthier bees. Just like human beings, correct? <laughs> Diversity is good, which leads to our next question. Our good friend, Sarah, and a technical advisor asks, what do you think about crickets and other bugs as a source of nutrition for humans? And then she had to put that in because she knows all of us that she'd rather have a good steak. Oh she yeah. More insect products on the market. Boy, it's coming. Um, a lot of a lot of products. Um, we're eating bugs without knowing it. So a lot of uh, you know nutritional supplements. Uh, a lot of bars that you pick up. A lot um, you know nutrition bars that you pick up. They say added protein. A lot of times that is insect protein now. Okay, so we are going to be consuming more insect protein. Um, most likely it's not going to be in a form that we can recognize right now just because our 
our Western culture doesn't accept that. Um, boy, it's a, it's a pretty regular and popular thing. If you go to a place like China or Thailand, um, they, they gobble it up like crazy. I had some wonderful chili flavored locusts uh, at a street market in Beijing and they were awesome. So uh, sometimes I'd, I'd crave it. And I, I do think that they will become a, an important part of our diet. How big and how quickly, I'm not quite sure yet, but um, why not? You know, if we can, if with, with, with this thought in mind, you know, like anything else, like all other food products, if we can, if we can produce them and consume that protein and that fiber in a way which aligns with ecological principles, um, more power to us, right? Um, if, if we're going to grow them in monoculture, we're not going to be getting the benefits that we, that we think we're going to. Yeah. John Lundgren made a batch of cricket cookies in my house one day, and I'm just glad my wife didn't find out about that. But that's yeah. a story for another day. Right. You can, uh, you can eat cookies and floss at the same time with the legs, right? <laughs> yeah, didn't try that one. <laughs> okay, here we have a really good question. What would be more valuable for insect populations? Prairie strips with monoculture plantings or a field completely planted to interseeded uh, cash crops with cover crops interseeded into them? Okay, great question. Um, we get this question pretty often. And the answer is this, like if you can do both, that's obviously the best thing because there are certain uh, life histories of different types of invertebrates that are going to require the stability of a perennial strip, a perennial area, um, whereas there's plenty of insects that are going to be able to survive out in that um, more open area where you're diversifying throughout the season by interseeding. Um, if I was going to, gosh, I don't want to choose one. I want them both. Um, but uh, let's see here. I think you have to do, you have to do both, right? You need, if you're really looking to get um, the diverse insect community that you want, maintain areas, you know, a corner of the field, end rows, ditches, whatever, with diverse plant community where some more of the sensitive insects can go to overwinter to recolonize that field. But do your darndest across that whole field to maintain the soil food web uh, in a way which will allow a persistent community of insects to emerge from the soil throughout, not having to recolonize a field. Because whenever you're depending on an insect community to recolonize a field, say to stave off an aphid uh, explosion, it's tough, right? It's tough to ask uh, because it's too late, right? Oftentimes the aphid population's gotten too large for an incoming beneficial insect population to, to, to take care of. But it, it's uh, simple, right? And it's, it's absolutely easy if there is a persistent community of, you know, a beneficial fungi, pathogenic fungi and, uh, and uh, predatory insects that are already allowed to harbor in that space to gobble up those first couple of, um, they're called funditrix, uh, aphids that fall from the sky basically and land in the middle of your field, right? If you've got predators out there, they're much likely, they're much more likely going to stave off that um, population explosion early on by eating those, those, uh, those pioneering individuals rather than colonizing the field from a border. That's too much information, but that's my answer. Good answer. Brad asks, we've talked a lot about food source plants. How can we use these practices to help benefit non-food source plants, such as hemp, where the main concern is mites? Where the main concern would be mites? Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, it's going to be, the, the principles are going to be exactly the same. They're absolutely going to be exactly the same. You have to start from the base of the soil food web. Um, and what, what is that? Well, that's, that's plants. It's the only thing that we, that mother nature has, has given us. It's a wonderful, powerful tool. And as long as we 
take our nuggets of information from mother nature and look at um, the way that she designs a healthy and diverse ecosystem, the base of that food, uh, of that food web, if we have diverse plant communities, we don't see population swings of insects happening, right? So let's take a hemp field. If we are out there and maintaining ground cover, we're purposefully um, uh, uh, planting green and maintaining a green bridge so that our microbe community is always there. We're not disturbing the soil and killing insect larvae and, and eggs, and we're providing them food. If we're making it look, uh, if we're mimicking mother nature in what she would do, we're not going to have troubles, right? And that's going to be the same principles that are going to work in food crops and also fiber crops and oil crops. Okay. Ann Fisher, how are you this evening? Ann asked, what is the best way to deal with slugs? Slugs are a stinker. Um, I have, uh, yeah, I had slugs in my garden last year. Um, and I tried my darndest to get as many uh, beetles in there as possible. Um, and out in a large field, um, it can be a difficult situation, but the answer is that uh, slugs are very oftentimes killed by pathogenic, pathogenic nematodes, fungi, and also ground beetles. So utilize what you know about your soil food web and your ecosystem to try and promote those individuals, those predators, um, and they will help you stave off that, that population. You know, do some homework into the biology of slugs, figure out what they like, where they thrive, and utilize that against them. They like extremely moist situations, you know, perhaps consider your cropping rotation around that knowledge. Uh, find, out, find out some more information about um, slugs and their biologies and find their weak point. Um, and, and, and most importantly, um, provide the resources that are needed for ground beetles and other predators. If a, if a, if a population is, is exploding, if you've got a lot of slugs, you can go in for a rescue um, by purchasing um, nematodes, you know, that, that are specific to slugs. Um, but again, with the understanding that we really need to go a step further if we're going to prevent that from happening in, in the future. Or, and just make candy bars out of them, sell the candy bars. Yuck. Nathan asks, can you talk about the degree of negative impact there is on native bee populations from honeybee colonies? Yeah, um, it's a question that comes up periodically. Um, and uh, what we see is that the honeybees themselves are perhaps, if they are, if they do have any degree of negative impact on the native pollinators, it pales in comparison to the negative impact that tillage has on their population. So if we are going to be concerned about native pollinators, what we need to do is make sure that they have a place that they can uh, complete their life cycle in the first place. And number one rule is, is that many, many native pollinators, native bees are ground nesting bees and require undisturbed soil um, in order to complete their life cycle. So the jury's out on the degree uh, to which honeybees uh, negatively impact. I do think that it's uh, should be a background conversation to the one that we can, uh, that I know that we can improve. Very good. Kurt asks, do sugar sources or compost teas or extracts complement insect pest predation? Yeah, uh, so I just I just read through uh, um, the uh, Jeff Lewinfeld um, teaming with microbes book and and went through a lot of those 
the compost and compost D chapters and did a little bit of thinking about this. Um, what I would say is that anything that we can do to improve the soil microbial community is going to improve the ability of a plant to resist a pest attack. Um, there are really interesting studies that show that when a plant is being attacked by an insect, a pest insect, what you might think would, would, would happen is that that plant would get, be more greedy with its nutrients and its plant root exudates. You'd think it would harness more of that into growth, like emergency growth, but that's not at all what happens. When a plant senses that it's, been, it's being fed on by a pest, you see the amount of plant root exudates increased significantly. And what it's thought, what, 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 what entomologists and, and plant, uh, plant folks think is happening is that they are stimulating the microbial community below the soil surface to balloon in size. And then what happens is that those microbes below the soil surface can oftentimes manufacture natural pesticides or anti-feedant chemicals that the plant can then take up and utilize against the pest attack. So the plant is using it, what's called its extended phenotype, right? It can't necessarily fight off this insect pest on its own, but it can employ its partners, right? Its partnerships. And that synergism is what allows a, a healthy plant with a healthy microbial community to ward off pest attacks. So back to compost and compost teas. From what I understand, and I compost like it's going out of style, I haven't used too many compost teas, but when you have the microbial community going, those plants are extra happy. Um, so composts and anything that increases your uh, diversity and abundance of soil microbes is going to be an excellent thing uh, for warding off insect pests. Okay. Very good. Here's a question we, we've heard a number of times. Uh, Paul asks, understanding that prairie strips and buffers are good, how far into the field is the reach of the insect impact from those? Right. Okay. And uh, we have done a bit of study on this. And the answer is, when you have a perennial prairie strip and you go let's say 10 meters into the field, you see a very strong similarity in the insect uh, community that was in that perennial strip. You go 100 meters into the field, you see a fraction of, you know, a, a fair fraction. You see some of the members that came from that perennial strip. You go up to a half mile, you see a minority of them. So it's a gradient, right? Um, at the beginning of my talk, I said there's 7 million, estimated 7 million species of invertebrates, which means there's 7 different, 7 million different capabilities of, of dispersal of these different types of critters. And you'll have anything from um, a beetle or a wasp that a half mile into a field is, is piece of cake or you'll have um, a linifeid spider, a small sheet weaving spider that is an excellent predator, but they're tiny, right? They, they can't go very far. So it's, it's this gradient, right? And you're gonna have to look at your own uh, field and understand your constraints. And what I would tell you is that more strips closer together are better. I understand those constraints do what you can because of that varying degree. Obviously, the more, the more, you know, the majority of a field that's into a, a perennial diverse habitat, that's going to be, uh, you're going to have increased pest um, protection from that type of scenario. It's a, it's a question that's tough to answer um, because of the incredible diversity of insects. We recommend, oh, you know, if you can do a hundred yards, that's pretty darn good. You're gonna see a lot of insects with the capability of traveling that far overnight. Yeah. Good. 
Uh, we're going to wind it up in just a couple more questions. We have several people asking about grasshoppers. Best control for grasshoppers. Grasshoppers. Grasshoppers require and love bare soil. They need to have bare soil in order to have a warm enough situation uh, for their eggs to develop and also to, to, it's called oviposit, to lay their eggs in the soil. Um, a soil that has cover, thatch, a dense, uh, a dense layer of residue thatch, um, the way that grasshoppers are shaped, the way that their brains work, the way that they react to their environment, they're unable to get themselves into a physical situation where they can insert their eggs into the soil. So thick layers of thatch um, really impede future generations of grasshoppers. Okay, very good. And then uh, we have a question as far as where to find seed besides organic that's not treated. Is that still on the Blue Dasher website, Mike? Yeah, Blue Dasher website has a resource um, that uh, that has, we, we actually looked up that we there should be a data sheet on there, which has some of the companies that if you call, they're able to get you untreated seed. Now, I know it's a lot of folks say that it's uh, extremely difficult to find the seed. Um, for almost all of my studies, I have to find naked untreated seed. And really it's not been that difficult for me to find it. If I call around and if I call early enough. And also something to note, um, when you are talking to a, a, a seed salesperson, um, they're oftentimes going to try and sway you away from using naked seed or they'll tell you that, well, you may have to charge more for the naked seed because it's going to be special or whatever. But that's negotiable. I've done that many times. Um, just simply, just simply state that you're 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 purchasing um, less, right? You're you're not uh, you're not uh, paying for that extra ingredient. Um, and if you put, you know, a little bit of pushback actually goes a long way. And I've been able to um, don't don't pay more for it. Um, do your due diligence, call around. It's not that hard to find untreated seed. Um, yeah, just be, that's just right. Be it's strong. becoming much more common, yep. much more common. So, uh, we apologize. We're not going to be able to make it through all the questions this evening. If you have specific questions you'd like answered, uh, please just email them to understanding ag and we will address those as quick as we can. On behalf of Understanding Ag Soil Health Academy, I want to thank Dr. Bredesen for being with us this evening. It was a really a wonderful webinar. We thank you so much. Uh, we have a number of webinars planned for the near future, so please tune in to the Understanding Ag and Soil Health Academy websites to check them out. With that, I want to thank everyone for attending tonight. Very good webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, you guys. Thanks so much. Take care. That was great. You were awesome. <laughs> I appreciate it. Have appreciate a good evening. That. All right.